My name is Luth Iglesias. I work in recruitment at the Ian Martin Group, a Canadian-owned staffing company. We help companies hire people, particularly engineers, technical, and IT workers. And we operate in several countries around the world and are probably unique in the staffing industry as a self-organized company. Our journey with self-organization started with a team of six people inside of uh, a company of several hundred. I was the head of recruiting at the time um, on that team and uh, I was one of those six people who on Valentine's Day 2015 gave up positional authority or my manager powers to instead uh, embrace a system of self-organization. All of the things that managers do in a traditional organization still have to be done in self-organization. So coordinating vacations and assigning work and dealing with performance issues and making decisions. The difference in self-organization is instead of reserving that type of work only for people called managers, self-organization makes that type of work available to everyone through a series of what we call practices. Okay, so there's this practice and there's that practice. Which one to use in which situation? And it was that question that drove um, me and some others that I worked with to come up with what we call our teal operating system, which is essentially a, a one-page flow chart that guides any person in the company to know what practice to use in what situation. At any given time across the organization, the TEAL operating system is in use by many people, many groups, many functions who are running different uh, practices and processes simultaneously around the company. And to give you a specific example, I am going to show you a decision that was made in the recruiting leadership team. All decisions begin at the top of the operating system when someone notices a problem or opportunity. So in this case, we were coming into fiscal year 20 and recruiting leaders started to talk about maybe this is a good opportunity to review the way that we use variable compensation um, in our team. And the first question uh, that needs answering is, is this worth pursuing? The options are yes, I'm not sure, or no. And in this case, through conversation, it, it was clear that this was a yes. Um, it was something that people wanted to at least review and possibly make changes to. Uh, the second question here is what type of problem or opportunity is this? And there are three choices. The first is behavioral or interpersonal. So uh, compensation is definitely not in that category. The second is role or impact, which relates to an individual person's role or contribution to the organization. And then there's everything else. So compensation would fall in that third bucket, and that leads to a set of practices that we call sensing and responding. And the first step is to appoint a steward. So that was my colleague, Ratish Manivanan. And you can see here in Lumio, this is the tool that we use to manage our decision-making processes, that Ratish has started a thread related to variable compensation or bonus for leaders in the current fiscal year. And you'll see here lots of people, including myself, saying, I personally liked using productivity ratio as our goal last year and recommending that we do the same in the year ahead. Here are some of my colleagues saying the same. So at some point, I think it became clear to Ratish that using productivity as a measure for us was working and people were in favor of it. So he made that proposal that we base our fiscal year 20 compensation on the same. On that proposal, there is lots of agreement, lots of green thumbs, and um, we move on to the second phase of the proposal, which now has a different steward. The steward on the second phase of the proposal is my colleague Jillian from finance. And here Jillian has the task of putting the specifics to the plan. How will bonus payments be paid out? On what timeline and in what quantities and with what criteria? Here when she begins to gather advice, you'll see a lot more disagreement about how the specific 
plan should work and disagreement and ideas and I think this is more important or I think that's more important and here's the implication with taxation. So many, many perspectives here to be considered. Ultimately, Jillian makes a proposal which is consented to despite some disagreement. We use consent-based decision-making in order to move forward even when there's disagreement. This is in contrast to consensus-based decision-making where everyone has to agree or view something the same way. We don't wait for that. If people can live with the proposal, then it has, um, it has their consent to move forward, even though they might have some reservations uh, about its details. So you can see here, both parts of the proposal are ultimately consented to. And this means we also have a great record of the discussion of who agreed and who disagreed and who thought it should be this way or that way. That's a very valuable learning tool for future. We can see patterns in people's advice, in our biases, in the way that we manage tensions, and that can inform future decisions when um, you know, if this decision turns out to be a real positive, we can, we can go back and analyze why. If it turns out really poorly, we can go back and analyze why. So we have found that the documentation of decision making and of varied perspectives is a powerful engine for learning. This video was a collaboration between the Ian Martin Group and Lumio. Check the description of the video for a free Lumio trial and also the full version of the TO operating system chart you saw before. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.